Okay. Looks like, okay, microphone works, so that's good. We'll see if I get any takers, but if anything, this will be reviewed or recorded for my classes so you can see it later. So I am going to wait about two or three minutes to get started and just go through this review for you guys. Uh, this is to give you just kind of a quick, quick content review, places in your notes that you probably want to continue to look at, some things that you should look at a little bit deeper, um, and overall stuff that'll help you get prepared for the test. Okay, so um, I'm going to start with unit one. Obviously, <laughs> from the top here, and that's going to be really focusing on the Renaissance and parts of the Age of Discovery. And again, when we look at the Renaissance, this was um, what we look at as a rediscover rediscovery, if you will, of ancient knowledge, um, which led to an expansion, uh, uh, expansion of things like science and tech and art and even statecraft. And much of it was this concept of renewal because we're coming out of the Black Plague, we're coming out of the Middle Ages, and this is going to be something that will allow Europe to advance from what things were like prior to this time period. Now, where the knowledge was coming from that these people were going to take and expand upon from a variety of sources, some was actually still local, whether it was accessed through monasteries or old libraries or private collections. A lot of it was gathered from the Muslim world, particularly through trade with the Italians. And as a result, they were able to bring things back to Europe. And that is one of the main reasons why when we look at the Renaissance and wonder why it started in Italy, this really is the particular reason for that. Okay. Um, because of this trade, because the economics were there, because the Roman world wasn't quite dead in Italy, and so when you put all those things together, it made sense that Italy was kind of the, the center of this. Now, at the core of the Renaissance and the expansion of learning and art and architecture and all this type of stuff was this concept of humanism. And so the idea with humanism is this is kind of the development, if you will, of trying to get a deeper understanding of why people do what they do. Okay, so why... Do we act the way we do? Why does the world function in the way that it does? And we want to get the answers to that. So as a result, this is why in the development of this humanism is what gives us the revival of Greek learning. It is one of the reasons that we will see in this era challenges to power of the church. It will lead to scientific inquiry it will lead to questions of power and rulers. Um, and humanism really was the basis for so many of the advances at this time because it provides kind of the impetus to get people to simply know things. Now, when you look at the humanists and, and things that you want to review in your notes, guys, you know, some of the big ones that stick out are guys like Petrarch. Uh, Lorenzo Valla, Marsilio Ficino, and Pico della Marandola. Um, when you look at what these guys were able to do, and, and they looked at it from a, a different um, uh, a different angle. You know, Petrarch is going to be really big about learning and understanding Latin at a deeper level and trying to get people to, um, you know, read Latin more and understand it. Uh, a guy like Lorenzo Valla, Valla is going to actually get um, – when he looks at ancient Latin sources and trying to verify whether they're real or not, you know, the idea that we need to look at this ancient knowledge, but we need to get a, a deeper examination of it. We can't just take it at, at face value. And when you look at that, that becomes really, really influential. Now, 
some other guys that really focused on bringing back some of this old knowledge and then trying to expand upon it would be guys also like Leonardo Bruni, the scientist, and Leon Baptiste Alberti. And again, the theme with these guys is that they are taking some of that Greek and not and and and, now, and Roman knowledge from guys like you know um, Aristotle and Demosthenes and and all all of the kind of big names there. But really looking at, is it valid? Is it true? And how can we figure this stuff out? But along with that, we also have advances in statecraft. Um, you have a man by the name of Baldastari Castiglione, who talks about how kind of a little bit about government structure, but his book uh, about the courtier of understanding the role of men in politics and how they should act and what are the types of things that they can do. Um, he had these ideas along with Francesco uh, Guicciardini, and they're trying to advance the kind of these ideas of civic humanism that we also need to give back to our communities through um, participation in the political process. But of course, the biggest name when it comes to statecraft was uh, Niccolo Machiavelli. And I mean, you, you can't really deny that, right? Uh, his influence on the development of absolutism, which will start in this time period and continue on afterwards, is tremendous, okay? It's, it's absolutely tremendous what it does, okay? He... This idea on whether to be loved or feared, the idea on do rulers need to be moral, and ultimately the concept of putting the nation before all other things and that princes must act unilaterally is huge. And that book, The Prince, was, was so, so influential during this era. I mean, you can't stress that enough. Now, to go along with all of these writings that were coming out, you also had the development of art at this time, okay? Now, when you look at the art and architecture of the, like, the Gothic period, you know, you had these giant, massive cathedrals. Uh, when it came to, like, painting and things like that, it wasn't particularly good. But during the Renaissance, there's going to be two things that really will expand the art world, okay? Um, one is the development of the patron system. The fact of the matter is it became an in thing to do for wealthy people to pay artists to do work. And then the church would also pay artists to do work. And what that means is that if you happen to have the talent of many of these, that many of these artists do, that you can make a living and you can survive and you can thrive. What also goes along with that was the development of schools of art. Okay. And those schools are going to be really, really important in honing skills and developing things like, you know, multiple point perspective, chioscuro, which is the looking of the, the different, um, the, the play of light and shadows, really looking how to depict humans as they are, um, as well as, you know, having these religious and mythological origins as well. Um, the key artists to know, I mean, they're the big names, you know, some of the Ninja Turtles and others. I mean, obviously you have Raphael, um, the School of Athens and what he was able to do there. We have Donatello, who really comes in, in the uh, form of sculpture early on. Um, Leonardo da Vinci, who kind of melds art with science. And of course, the uh, Brunelleschi, who's your not only great artist, but the architect building the Il Duomo. Um, and bringing domes back into play, which hadn't been used since the Romans, as well as other architectural features. And of course, the greatest of them all, Michelangelo, uh, from his skill as a sculptor, which is what he thought he primarily was with, you know, like, you know, David, and of course, considered to be perhaps the greatest sculptor of all time, the Pieta, to what he was able to do on the ceiling of the Sistine Chapel, to what he was able to do to design the Basilica of St. Peter's. Um, it, it, it's pretty remarkable. And this art will be heavily, heavily influenced through, you know, from Greek and Roman ideas, but also the predominant subject matter is religion, okay? Um, religion by far is the most important. I mean, you can see there's pictures of Mary just everywhere, lots of depictions of Jesus and heaven and God, 
Um, and then you throw in some things like some mythological figures and, and stories from Greek and Roman times. And it, it really kind of reignites art. And there's a reason if you ask someone today to name an artist, there's a really, really good chance they're going to name a European artist for you. Now, again, a lot of these guys that I just talked about, the focus was on Italy and what was going on down there. However, there was a renaissance that happened a little late, little bit later on. It starts from Italy and some of these ideas spread up and we get the northern renaissance in focuses in places like, say, um, England and the Netherlands. Um, religion is still a big focus and important here, but we, we still start to see some changes. We'll actually see some scientists from this area that I'll be talking about when I go over unit four. But um, you, you have some different artists up here, like a Peter Bruegel. And when you look at what, say, the English and the, the Dutch masters were working on, they instead, when it came to art, were trying to focus on real life situations, everyday people, and kind of how the world was. Where if you looked at a, the, the Italian artists, you would see, of course, the religious influence, but in many cases, kind of an idealized version of the perfection of people and stuff like that. Um, when we come to all of this as well, one of the big things to talk about here, and, and I'll get into it later though, is I mentioned a lot of writing. And in the North, you also have some influential people, particularly a form of religion when you guys got like Erasmus, John Wycliffe, Jan Hus, Martin Luther, and I'll talk about them in the, in the next unit. But <clears throat> when it comes to the Northern Renaissance and the guy that really is the spur for most of the Renaissance is Johann Gutenberg, right? Most of you know who Johann Gutenberg is. You understand the importance of the printing press, but it's gonna come up. It's gonna be a question somewhere on the test. I don't care where, it's Gutenberg, he's there. It changes literacy, it changes language, it helps to spread revolution. Um, perhaps the most single most important invention outside of, I, I, don't, I don't know. Outside, I mean, yeah, yeah, I guess you throw like the computer or the internal combustion engine. But as far as thought and scholarship is concerned, the printing press is what changes everything. And for some of my people that I do see here, you know, you can always feel free if you have a question, you can throw a, you know, type in a question or it'll pop up. I can always try to answer that for you. All right. So now I want to kind of move on in unit one here and get into the development of state control and monarchies and some of the economic systems that were going on here. And again, I'm going to keep it pretty brief. Um, again, the purpose is just kind of giving you an idea of what we are expecting and then you can look in your notes or watch some more of my videos on the channel to uh, shore up your knowledge of those topics. Um, of course, at this time, what we are working on and what monarchy is really going to start to work on is trying to end feudalism, trying to curtail the power of the nobility and start to develop more centralized nations or the development of the state. Whereas under feudal, feudalism, you didn't really have a nation, right? Most people just identified as themselves being from a particular province or the lands of a particular noble. Um, many of them may not even know who the king even was. Um, you can really see rulers here trying to develop national identities, uh, national languages, standardizing weights and measures. Um, really the big thing is about controlling taxes and revenue, developing of standing armies, and forging nations. Um, and we do have the rise of absolute monarchies, and that's really going to be the theme of this particular era of the 15th century into the 16th century, part of the 17th century, um, and then the 18th century is when we'll really see the challenges to that is developing the power of the centralized monarch. And again, the way that you do this, you know, I, I have four main things here, okay? Um, number one is your standing army, an army that is not loyal to nobles, is not raised by nobles, but rather is raised and maintained by the crown, number one. Number two, you're gonna centralize tax collection. You need that revenue, you need that money. And so that's one of the, biggest things and no one ever talks about like tax collection i'm not gonna lie it's boring it's not fun but when it comes to 
how rulers consolidate power. They need money to do that. So tax collection is huge there. We are going to see the centralized centralization, if you will, of law codes, of having standard law codes. Now, for a while, a lot of these law codes will apply differently to like the nobles versus the, the lower class because those societal divisions aren't going anywhere anytime soon. But centralized law code, so one law code that eventually goes back uh, to um, uh, thanks there. Thanks there, Brian. Uh, appreciate it, buddy. Uh, I think I know which Brian this is. I'm not sure, but, uh, appreciate the comment. Um, and so when, when you have that centralization of a law code, it makes it easier. And then all of the, the ultimate judgment goes through the king. And then finally, we're going to try to control religion. Now, in this case, it's pretty much all Catholicism, but you're going to see, um, what's the word I'm looking for? You're going to see greater, uh, control of clergy and things like that within, um, these nations. You're going to see more working with the Pope instead of for the Pope. And yeah, you put those four things together. That's going to be really important. Now, the guy, so who do you got to know when it comes to all of this? So these are the big things that I'm going to tell you to review and just take kind of a quick look at, okay? You want to look at in England. So we'll start in England. In England, you're going to look at Henry VII, Henry VIII, and Elizabeth, okay? Those three people. Henry VII, who really did consolidate a lot of power uh, after the War of the Roses. Then we're going to go to Henry VIII and, of course, Elizabeth there. In Spain, we want to look at Ferdinand and Isabella and how they're able to consolidate power. And then you can also look at their son, um, Philip II. In the Holy Roman Empire, you want to look at the methods of control enacted by Charles V. And finally, in France, we want to look at what Louis XIII and perhaps the absolutist of all monarchs, Louis XIV, was doing. And then in Russia, you can look at Michael Romanov, actually, really, Ivan III, Ivan IV, Michael Romanov, and then Peter. Now, I'm going to talk Ivan III, IV, and Peter a little bit later, because um, they kind of, you know, they're, they're a little bit later time-wise. But as far as absolute monarchs are concerned, they're really good examples of that as well. And so, like, what are the examples of control that they're doing? Um, you can look at the, in Spain, you have the, the, um, Spanish Inquisition, the use of that power, um, a lot of religious things too. So like uh, the Concordat of Bologna, you can look at in England, the English Book of Common Prayer to centralize and control of religion. Um, you can look at the English Star Chamber. That was kind of like those shady courts that were set up by Henry VII to basically get rid of any enemies of the state. Uh, also trying to have religious balance when Henry IV does something like the Edict of Nantes or things like the Peace of Augsburg. So you kind of put those together. Again, it's about centralized control and absolutism. Um, as far as economics of these nations are concerned, we are going to see the development of more um, systems that we are familiar with when it comes to the early development of capitalism, which I'm going to talk a little bit more with age of discovery. But um, during this time, we're going to have the growth of the merchant class, which is going to challenge the power of your traditional nobles, who, of course, will be land based. Uh, we will see this most notably in Italy, particularly like the de' Medici family of Florence. Uh, and then we will also start to see it in places like the Netherlands and the development of the big time companies there. Um, these merchants are going to push for greater rights and equality because the fact of the matter is they control more money and they really have more influence than many of these just simple land owning nobles. Um, as a result, you're going to see the rise of things like banking as a profession and these incredibly powerful bankers. Again, I already mentioned the de' Medici. You also have the Fuggers as well as great examples of the power of these banks. Um, or the nobles of the robe in France, um, which are men that get titles, uh, nobles of the robe, because of their wealth, not necessarily their birth. And, you know, the development of some economic things as a result of um, the commercial revolution, I'm going to get to that in just a second. Okay. So that kind of ends the Renaissance part. Now I'm going to jump over here to the age of exploration. Okay. And when we come to the age of exploration, 
All right, the key thing that we are seeing here that we need to discuss is new technology. So how are the Europeans going to get everywhere? It is because of new technology, and most of the technology came from the Muslim world, with the exception of Zheng He over there in the Ming Dynasty in China. If you were looking at the most far-flung sailors in the world at the time in the 1400s, it's going to be the Muslims. And so when you get leaders like um, John in Portugal, or sorry, King Henry the Navigator in Portugal, who is going to look to embrace a lot of this stuff, he's getting a lot of those, those technological advancements from the Muslim nations. Okay. And so what are we looking at here? So we're going to look at the magnetic compass. We're going to look at the Portolani. We're looking at the stern post rudder, things like the astrolabe uh, that helps monitor stars, the latin sail, triangular sail, which catches wind better. Uh, things like the caravel or the fluid, which are different types of ships that are designed to handle full ocean going vessels or full ocean going travels and contain lots of cargo because it's about the cargo. Um, and then on the side, we have the development of mapping. So finally, at this time, we're going to have development of longitude and latitude, which of course is a game changer because you know exactly where you're at, as well as mapping of coastlines and currents, which again will enable faster and safer travel. Okay. So, of course, the big guy here. Now, I'll talk about some other guys in a minute, but we have to understand that Columbus is the guy that is out in front, okay? I'm not here to talk about all the debates here. The, the fact of the matter is, as far as the test is concerned, Columbus is the guy in the front. He is the guy that changes everything. He got to the New World first, had subsequent voyages. Because of what he found, the rest of Europe is going to come. And as a result, the Columbian Exchange, which we'll talk about in a second. The other big guys that you would probably want to know about, uh, of course, you have the Portuguese Vasco da Gama, who goes around Africa and gets all the way over to India, which is going to be really, really important. Um, you can also get, um, like later on, like Englishman uh, Captain Cook, uh, you also have the conquistadors who take out the only big empires that were over there. That's what's really, really important. The fact of the matter is, is any big time resistance to European occupation was going to come from either the Mexica slash Aztecs or the Inca. And when Cortez takes out the Mexica and Pizarro takes out the Inca, there's really no chance that anybody has. Yes, there's going to be resistance here and there. Don't get me wrong. It absolutely happens in a variety of different times, but they don't have the population and they don't have the weaponry to actually do it. So in general, where were people exploring? This is actually going to be important to know. We need to know some geography, right? So we have the Spanish who focus on the New World. The West. So when we talk about like Mexico, Central America, and all of South Africa, with the exception of Brazil, because that's the Portuguese, uh, but the Portuguese also do the coast of Africa and India. Um, the Spanish are also the Western United States of America. Then you have the British who focus on the Caribbean and North America, and both the British the the, sorry, all three, the British, the Portuguese, and the Spanish are making settler colonies, bringing over colonists to control more land. Then you have the French, which are mostly in modern day Canada, as well as the central part of the United States of America. They're going to go a little bit of a different route, which is setting up like trading posts and stuff like that. And then the Dutch will do that as well. Well, um, they're not really big enough to control a lot of area. The only area that Dutch are really going to focus on controlling will be Indonesia because they had had to have themselves some nutmeg. But most of their area will be finding little trading posts and the development of these trading posts and colonies all over uh, the world. And why are they doing this? You know, of course, it's resources. It's about the development of wealth. We want things like gold and silver. We want things like spices. We want things like agricultural goods. And we want things like luxury goods that we can't get anywhere in Europe. And thus, that's why everybody is coming over here. The other big thing, though, that we talk about as well will be the... Um, the spread of Christianity, particularly in what today is known as Latin America, uh, especially when the Jesuits get over here, which were not only big on 
uh, centralizing power, if you will. I mean, they actually create their own state in Paraguay at one point, but they are really focused on spreading the faith and they have a tremendous amount of success doing that. And that is why if you go from Mexico down in Latin America, the vast majority of people there are Catholic and that's pretty influential. Now, we'll talk about some of the impacts of this in a second, but because of all of this spreading out and trying to conquer places, we are going to see a variety of conflicts over expansion, okay? So you're going to have things like the War of Spanish Succession, the biggest one, of course, which is the Seven Years' War, which is our first world war because it is fought in England, not in England, it's fought um, somewhat in Europe off the coast of India, as well as in the new world. Um, so that's really, really tremendous. So you want to make sure you kind of read up on the war of Spanish succession, know the seven years war. Um, also uh, the issues with pirates and the how in many cases, nations would employ pirates to attack each other, most notably the Spanish and the English. Eventually the pirates got too bad that they had to just go after all of them, but it was definitely a tactic. And we do see uh, conflicts between these nations that will continue on in the future. Now, the big thing here uh, that does happen is the Colombian exchange. And I'm sure a lot of you have talked about it extensively. And the idea is this is the exchange of goods and people um, and disease from the from Afro-Eurasia, bringing it over into North and South America. And the fact of the matter is, is the group that ends up out on the biggest of this is the Europeans. They're able to bring in tons of new foods, fruits and vegetables, potatoes, that are really going to diversify their diets and make them healthier. Um, they're going to be able to introduce cash crops into this area, most notably sugar, which is the biggest one, tobacco and cotton, in which they're going to be able to make tremendous amounts of money off of, which will help fund their dominance of the world. They're able to get natural resources that they will bring back that will help to fuel what will become the Industrial Revolution. And this is what really is going to push with the knowledge gained also during the Renaissance, which is going to push Europe from not really particularly powerful as far as the world is concerned, to being the dominant force in the world for the last say 250 or so years. The biggest negative though, or, and then also coming over here, not only that, you will have the introduction of animals, of course, uh, pigs and chickens and cows, goats, sheep did not exist in the Americas before then, they're going to be brought over. Um, there's going to be massive changes to the environment because there's going to be tons of clearing land, cutting down trees, all that type of stuff to create farms. And of course, the introduction of disease, which is really one of the main reasons, probably the main reason why the Europeans will eventually be able to conquer and their descendants will be able to conquer the entirety of the Americas because diseases like smallpox and diphtheria and influenza and malaria get over to here, having never been here before and wipe out so much of the population. Of course, we get numbers that could be upward of 90% of the population. But when it comes time to fight, so few people will be left to resist that they really just don't have a chance. Oh, also horses brought over here. Can't forget the horses. And really the, the, another huge negative then becomes the coerced labor, right? Of course, the big thing is the slave trade, which of course has devastating impacts on developing the racism and stereotypes that we see today. Um, complete disaster for 40 million plus people who are... Uh, kidnapped out of Africa. Many die along the way. Um, the developing of slave societies, which will cause a variety of issues as we move forward, and just all the ills and perils that we know about slavery. We also have forced labor systems like the encomiendas in Spanish held territories, which was the king of Spain giving um, Spanish traders the um, the rights to demand labor from the natives in each region up to a certain amount of time per year. And thus many were forced to work on plantations and in, um, in mines and just the overall treatment of the people of the Americas, as well as the slaves, clearly the, the largest negative uh, legacy of this particular time period. 
But the big change comes in the then the commercial revolution. Um, what we here have here is a massive expansion of banking and finance across Europe. It is absolutely going to change everything. We will see these giant organizations like the Bank of London and the Bank of Amsterdam, which begin to start to finance um, journeys of discovery and trade. And it's extremely lucrative. I always say this story, you know, we had the story of Magellan who sailed off with, a, you know, hundreds of men and five ships. And by the time Magellan's uh, to sail around the world, right? And they do it. But Magellan himself dies. There's only like 20 or 30 guys left. Um, and there's only one ship left, but that ship was plaque, packed with black pepper and a variety of other things. After covering all their losses, giving extra money to the families of the men who died, re, you know, having to rebuild all those ships that were lost, they still cleared a 200% profit. So it's all about money because things like sugar and pepper and these spices did not exist in Europe and it's going to be huge. Um, and so banking and financing, those things are going to be huge. And we get the development, our first mega corporations, if you will, with the development of the Dutch and British East India Company. The Dutch East India Company is the big one. They're called the VOC. I highly suggest watching the video about it that John Green did um, on Crash Course because it really gets in and discusses how powerful they were. But just to give an idea, I mean, and how powerful the uh, British East India Company is, at one point, they're so powerful that England employs them to run India for them um, when they you know, initially take it over. So the development of the international corporations that you know today that are super powerful, well, this is the time that they're getting there because this trade is so valuable. Um, we are also going to commercialize agriculture with these giant cash crops over in the new world. You'll get the enclosure movement in Europe in which you have large landowners are going to close off land. Um, peasants are going to have to become tenant farmers or rent, you know, the rent land, or they're just going to have to be regular workers. Um, they're going to lose village commons. Um and this move from cash crops away from sustenance crops is going to cause a problem in the long term because in many cases, what will end up happening is that there is a massive increase in the price of agricultural goods. Now, for the people that control the land, i.e. the wealthy landowners, that's okay because they're making out like bandits. But for the middle and poorer classes, which is the bulk of the people in the world, they have issues affording just food at this time. And it, it's really, really devastating. Um, and that's something that, that is, is going to be very impactful as we move on in the future. And as a result, we get some new economic elites, though. We, we get these large farm owners, particularly in the new world. So um, whether the English or Spanish or Portuguese come over here, they set up land and they become these new elites. Um, again, I mentioned the nobles of the robe, the Italian merchants and the bankers. So slowly but surely, they're going to start to take over. And by the 1800s, it's the wealthy that are running everything, not the nobility anymore. Okay. And when we actually look at Europe too, we, we are starting to see a little bit of a, of a, of a split in, in how we see Europe is developing in this time. So like in Western Europe, we're really seeing... Um, the development of free peasants and tenant farmers and stuff like that, who eventually will become a lot of the laborers in the cities. We're seeing merchants rise in wealth, power, and prestige. We're seeing the developments of the bankers. We're seeing more and more private landowners. In Eastern Europe, we're still going to see massive use of serfdom, um, nobles still running the show, um, these areas have lack of access to, um, easy ports. So it's going to be harder for them to get involved in, um, like the expansion of the age of discovery and stuff like that. And so that's where, and that's something to keep an eye out, you know, and, and when you're looking in, and you're reviewing for the exam, look at the differences that we're seeing in Eastern and Western Europe, because that's stuff that can definitely come up. And then finally, we have the really the beginning of urbanization. We're going to we're going to start to see the massive growth of cities. 
It's not really going to get going to the Industrial Revolution, but this is where we're going to see the beginnings of it. And we're going to see the beginnings of the problem of it. Like, how do you plan for urbanization? How do you provide housing? How do you deal with poverty and unemployment? And how do you deal with disease? Um, yes, the population has recovered from the Black Plague, but we'll have outbreaks of the plague. We'll have outbreaks of smallpox. We'll have outbreaks of diphtheria. We'll have outbreaks of cholera, really, until like Jon Snow and 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 all of the, the the virologists, if you will, are going to be able to figure out germs and germ theory and all that. Louis Pasteur, of course, the most important one there. But we're not going to see that till like I don't know the the 1800s. So we still got a while. Okay. All right. So that should sum up unit one. So let me get into some of my notes here for unit two. So I know what we're covering here. So unit two is really all about the Protestant Reformation. Okay. And, and how do we see everything that breaks down there? Um, understand that pre-Reformation, we did have a variety of reformers that were looking at, you know, the issues in the church. And again, when we look at what are the issues that the Catholic Church was looking at, right? We're looking at things like corruption and abuse of power. We're looking at unqualified priests. We're looking at the use of simony, which is the buying and selling of church offices. So anybody can become anything, including the Pope. I mean, the de' Medici family had two of um, two boys, ages nine and 11, made cardinals. And eventually they both became popes. That's a problem. Um, lay investiture in which um, rulers were given the right to appoint bishops, and cardinals, even if they didn't have any qualifications, massive spending. Um, there's a lot of issues here. And it seemed to be that the church had kind of lost its way. Is it every single priest? No, it's not. But it's the, the ones that are really in power and the structure of the church. And, and they're not helping the poor as much. And, and it, it, it's pretty problematic. Now, there were some people that started to speak out before, of course, the titan there of of, of of Martin Luther. We have guys like John Wycliffe in England who was starting to speak out against uh, the power of the church and the control of the church. Most notably, he publishes a Bible in English because, again, what we have to remember is that the church controlled your path to heaven and all masses were in Latin. And so all Bibles were in Latin. So only the priests could understand them. So that gives them a tremendous amount of control. John Wycliffe comes out, publishes the Bible, has to basically go into hiding. But that's how he's starting to resist. You have guys like Erasmus who tried to reform the church from within through writing things like the praise of folly um, and satire to try to garner more attention to some of the issues but at the same time, wasn't trying to upend the church, but was trying to address some of these problems. And then, of course, you have the the, the one that was the most aggressive, which, of course, is Jan Hus, uh, the Czech reformer who was really looking to challenge the power of the church and the clergy. And, of course, that resulted in him getting both captured and executed. But in the guy that really breaks it all loose was, loose was Martin Luther. And, and, and all of us have spent time in, in your various classes talking about Martin Luther. I'm not going to get too, too into it, you know, when you look at the causes, whether it's the indulgences and what got him going. But in the end, he's the one that writes those 95 theses and actively speaks out and writes out against the centralized power of the Catholic Church. And he basically breaks it. And so the big thing that we need to understand is one. So what helps Luther actually? What's the big thing? One, the printing press, because he is an avid writer. He's going to write a lot and those words are going to spread and he's going to write in German, publish a Bible in German. Boom. Number two, what was different about him than Jan Hus or John Wycliffe is he has help at the highest levels. A number of the main nobles in the Holy Roman Empire were supportive of Luther because of that, at the Diet of Worms, when Luther meets with Charles V, he makes the decision not to capture and execute him like his forefathers did to Jan Hus. Um, and he is able to be protected for his entire life. Um, and so when he is writing, so he, you know, what will develop into Lutheranism will be a rejection of the power of the papacy and the structure of the Catholic church. Most of the sacraments will remain 
the same Eucharist confirmation, baptism, stuff like that. Um, he is going to have a high focus on scripture and everyone reading the scripture. And really, uh, he'll allow clergy to marry. And in the end, the biggest thing is all about faith. When you look at Lutheranism and a lot of these Protestant groups is they're going to focus on faith, that if you don't have faith in God and Jesus, then nothing else matters. And, you know, you're not going to get into heaven. Now, he's going to also inspire another guy who's your other big titan at the time, Jean Calvin, or we know him as John Calvin, starts out of France, is very influenced by Martin Luther, eventually moves to Geneva in Switzerland, where he will run the city for a certain amount of time, and he develops Calvin. Calvinism. And what do we see in Calvinism? Of course, the big thing in Calvinism is predestination, this idea that God has selected this specific group of people to be, um, are the ones that were elected and they will go to heaven. But the way that you show that is through strict religious observance. And with him, he was really big about combining church and state, that church and state should be as one. And so when you look at, say, Calvin's Geneva, um, the church rules are what ruled the actual city. And we can see this as because one of the offshoots of Calvinists would be the Puritans and that's what they desired in England and they couldn't get it. And when the first Puritan community set up the United States of America, religion was a big part of how they ran everything. And it was really strict adherence, um, not a lot of interpretation of the Bible, and really a big focus on strict living, no drinking, no dancing, no singing, things like that. Um, very big on public humiliation as punishment. Um, but it was very, very effective. And in a time of chaos, which the Reformation was, it gave people a little bit more of a connection to religion and then a connection to each other. And the communities became very, very strong. And then you also have, which we'll talk about a little bit later, you know, religious wars that happened in a variety of countries. In France, basically, you went through some civil wars and religion was at the, the core of it. And so the Calvinists in France would be known as Huguenots. You also had another group that came out that was probably the most radical, the Anabaptists. These are groups that came out and said that there should be no child baptism, that uh, we should read the, the clergy, that we live together in communities, kind of a socialist type feel. But the rejection of child baptism basically got them hated by everybody and were attacked by everybody. And many of those Anabaptists, uh, which they eventually dropped the Anna and become Baptists, end up in the United States of America as a result of the persecution. So there you go. Um, not surprisingly, this results in a lot of wars, right? Because you had the popes trying to arrange fighting against you know, Catholic monarchs versus Protestant monarchs or Catholic monarchs versus Protestant princes or Protestant monarchs versus Catholics. Um, there were a variety of wars. Um, and because what ends up happening is a lot of these nobles use religion to challenge the power of monarchs. Okay. And so, and then at the same time, the monarchs are trying to keep control of the religion, as I said, in absolutism, because that's a way that you can control your country. Um, probably the biggest example of this would be the Thirty Years' War that envelops all of Europe, goes from 1618 to 1648. It is the largest and most costly war until World War I. Everybody always thinks it's the Napoleonic Wars. Napoleonic Wars were deadly. But I mean, like 30% of people in what is modern day Germany were killed in this war. It was devastating, um, caused as an initial result of religion. And then it was all about land acquisition and strengthening monarchies, um, especially when France came in at the very end on the side of the Protestants. It did shift the power. This is kind of the ascendancy of places like France um, and the the Austrian empire are going to start to grow. The Prussian empire is going to start to grow at this time. And so this is going to really put some nations on the map to move forward. Again, also have a video on this. I would give that just a quick watch. Um, you've got, uh, the Spanish invasion of England under Philip II. Um, that was really a crusade type situation. He was trying to bring Catholicism back into the fold there. And of course that was the 
famous Armada destruction of 1588. And then another notable one would be the French Civil War or the War of Three Henrys, which was basically between three different Henrys, not going to go into all of them here, but trying to get the power of the throne when the previous king dies in a hunting accident, a la Game of Thrones. Um, the role of the queen mother, Catherine de' Medici, who was virulently Catholic and her trying to get Catholics to eliminate uh, most the most notable Henry, who was Henry Navarre, who ends up coming out on top of this. There was the initial move to have Henry Navarre marry the former king's daughter, Marguerite, um, and that to unify everything. And that resulted in the St. Bartholomew's Day uh, massacre when the queen and her alliances try to take out all of the Catholics on St. Bartholomew's Day when the wedding was supposed to play, take place and Henry has to like jump out of a window. Um, but in the end, Henry will become the king. He will marry Marguerite. He does become King Henry IV. Um, and very interestingly, to kind of put an end to things, uh, passes the Edict of Nantes, which allows for religious freedoms in the in France. And then you will get various nobles that challenge the power of Charles V in the Holy Roman Empire. Now, Charles V does win, but he passes something known as the Peace of Augsburg, which to put an end to these wars allows nobles to choose what uh, what their religion will be in each province. And what we see here, we understand that toleration is what solves the problems, but the fact of the matter is, is even though at the end of the 30 years war, it kind of puts everything to bed, the conflicts between Catholics and Protestants will be pretty consistent and it will happen a lot. So something to keep our eye on moving forward. Now, eventually the Catholics have to respond, right? So, you know, they get shook, they lose a ton of political power. Um, their inquisitions are failing, except in places like Spain, um, because they do try to go a little aggressive early on. That They are hard line. You have the Roman Inquisition, you have the Spanish Inquisition. They develop the in index of prohibited books to ban all these books because they challenge their power. Um, they actively practice censorship, the famous trial of Galileo. But eventually there has to be some change, okay? And we get a variety of change. Um, some comes from structure. Um, the famous St. Teresa of Avila. Uh, St. Teresa is going to refocus on getting um, basically the dedication back to the church and getting back to the original message. And she's going to found an order of nuns um, and open a number of monasteries in which you have the nuns there refocusing on living in poverty in helping the community. Um, these nuns will also, in many cases, practice uh, ritual flatulation in which they will actually harm themselves because it's through the idea of, you know, suffering is what can allow you to understand Christ more. So that's a, that's a pretty big uh, thing there. And she's going to be really, really influential, lots of hard work. People are going to kind of follow that lead of what monasteries and in many cases, convents can do. Then, of course, you have the famous Ignatius Loyola, who uh, is a knight and gets injured and then comes back and starts an order of monks. And the purpose of the order of monks is to, again, get back to the original message of Jesus and really working on spreading it as um, missionaries. And of course, I've mentioned before, the Jesuits are going to have huge amounts of success in the new world, and they are going to be very big on education. One of the reasons why we have these Catholic schools and Catholic universities in not only the United States, but across the world is because of the Jesuits and their focus on education and spreading the message. Finally, we have Pope Paul III, who's the guy that really kind of puts everything back together in the late 1500s, uh, well after the death of Luther and stuff like that. He is going to put together the, the, the Catholic, the Council of Trent to fix things. So he's going to have specific laws for how you become a priest. He is going to start to regulate bishops more. They're going to try to prevent things like simony and lay investiture as well. Um, and But at the same time, they're going to reconfirm their faith that the belief system isn't going to change. The mass system isn't going to change, although they will start doing some masses in vernacular languages. 
Um, and what we're going to see for here is, is what the Catholic Church kind of goes into is going into a phase of where before it was more about you know, all about political control. The fact of the matter is, is with the rise of absolutism in nations and the efforts of Luther and the other Protestant reformers is that's gone. Okay. That, 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 that's just done. Um, and here it's about being a cultural force, which they still remain today. And in some cases being involved in politics at kind of the mass level. And we'll get into that at later times in the year. All right, last couple things to hit here. So what were some of the politics going on of the 16th and uh, century? And and really not necessarily politics, I'm sorry, because I kind of already went into the absolutism and the economics here. Rather, I'm going to get into some of the societal things. Um, so again, at the top, you have the landed aristocracy that do rule everything. Um, most of them don't have to pay much in the way of taxes, and they have a lot of legal protections that they often can't be punished for things. Uh, so most of the taxation falls on the other like 95% of the population, which would be what little middle class they were there were as far as like the craftsmen and kind of like lower merchants and the peasantry. Um, women had little to no opportunities. They were kept out of aristocratic, cir aristocratic circles. Some women, particularly in Italy, were finding ways to get educated. And we'll talk about some of those and the influence that some of those women have. But in general, it was very, very difficult. Um, they lacked things like inheritance laws. Um, and pretty much everything revolved around the necessitation of marriage. And so for women, equality, we're, we're going to have to wait a while here. Um, religion still heavily influences like public morals. So there are many secular laws about morality and marriage and what you can and can't do at home or things like prostitution and begging. And most of those would be regulated, but the views on how they should be done were really influenced by the church at this time. Um, there were things like fun. Uh, we did have the development of things like carnival, which I'll be talking about at a different time. Saints day festivities, uh, sports like boxing start to rise and wrestling start to rise in popularity. Um, and this is particularly for the people in the growing cities and the towns that are developing all across Europe this time, mainly because of trade. As far as law was concerned, uh, public punishments, public executions were pretty much the norm for everything. We don't really have jail yet. Um, that could be for some wealthy noble that you might chuck somewhere because they're causing problems. But for the most part, if you do a crime, you get punished for it, and then it's done. A lot of things they killed you for, hundreds of crimes they would kill you for. But more often than not, you got punished in some way, and that was kind of the end of it. And then we talked a lot about art already, but in the 16th and 17th century, we do have the development of more art after the Renaissance. One of those forms is mannerism. And so with the art of mannerism, uh, the whole purpose is to express emotion, things like anxiety, suffering, or uncertainty. Um, and they try to change up how they depict it. They don't use kind of that straight kind of Greek goddess view or this, that kind of perfection that the Renaissance was focusing on. They could be a little bit more free flowing. Some of the colors were different. Um, probably the most famous guy in mannerism that you definitely want to know. The guy there is El Greco. The other big art thing would be Baroque. And this is where you get a little bit of, I, you know, the ideas of the Renaissance, mixing it up with some religion, particularly the influence of the Protestant Reformation here, um, as well as trying to depict kind of regular things that happen as well, but also power, magnificence, and emotion, and movement. So a lot of different themes going on here. But what, what we see about these the, the Baroque guys is that they're much deeper. The colors are a bit darker. It's a little more shadow. Um, and trying to convey, again, that deeper emotion. Um, it's going to get big. It will start in Italy, but that will also go into France and the Netherlands. Um, so the Netherlands, you guys got you got guys like Peter Paul Rubens um, and Judith Leister. Um, and of course, the, the big guy who's Rembrandt um, in Italy, the Baroque guy we'll see here is Bernini. Um, really, really influential people that will continue to go throughout 
pretty much every section. I'm going to talk about some art at some point. And then we also have the development of theater. And of course, this is the influence of Shakespeare. Um, Shakespeare will be huge. His plays will be huge. And as a result, theater becomes enormously popular, even though it, uh, actors were looked down upon basically at the same level as prostitutes. Um, but it was something that was for everyone. You had different types of theaters. You, for instance, had the famous Globe Theater, which a lot of like um, kind of quote unquote regular people could go to, or then you had some higher end places like a place like Blackfriars. But the idea is that the, these plays and this entertainment becomes a huge, huge part of Europe and will continue. Okay. I mean, it does go all the way back to the Greek era. We know about the you know, Greek and Roman era, but particularly the Greek area with plays and playwrights and their, how famous they were and all the festivals around them. Well, that's really going to start to happen again. And writing is, is popular. I mean, you know, when, when you have these skilled writers like Miguel Cervantes and what he does with kind of the beginnings of the novel and with Don Quixote, one of the best-selling books ever. You know, very few books have sold more than Don Quixote and most of them are like the Bible or the Quran. I think Don Quixote is like number three or four. But and, and then you have Shakespeare, and, and they're just so titanic that everybody wants to try to emulate that. And theater and writing, that it's going to become a thing. And we're going to be talking more and more about literature and more and more about theater. At the time here, the big theater guys are Lope de Vega, uh, Jean-Baptiste Racine, and of course, probably the most famous is Moliere uh, with his play Tartuffe. Um, and what we're seeing is just more and more things for people to do more cultural activities things for them to see things for them to participate in and that's going to continue to grow all right guys for so for the people that came you know thanks for a lot for coming and hanging out here today um you know tell your friends i'm probably going to do another one maybe on thursday i think i'm going to be doing trying to do units three and four so keep an eye out for that you of course can go back to this and review it uh feel free to leave a comment somewhere to tell me what you think and thank you so much so take care everybody i hope to see you again soon